Tate, and I'm one of the reference librarians here at Seattle Central College. So I'm so glad that you're able to join us today. Can you raise your hand if you've been to a COSI before? Yeah. So we have some frequent flyers and then also some new people. So for those of you who are new, I'll introduce a little bit about the series and why we host this in the library. We hold conversations on social issues every Thursday in the library because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. And just like you're not going to agree with anything, with every single thing that you find on our shelves or in our databases, um, we don't expect you to agree with every single thing that you hear in one of these sessions. However, I will ask that you remain respectful um, and engage the entire time. So if you are interested in learning more about this topic after we have our wonderful speakers, we have some resources um, on the board that are available for checkout. And if you'd like even more information, come find me and I will help you find whatever your heart desires. At the end of this session, we'll ask you to fill out a brief survey, letting me know what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can improve. And next week, if you're able to join us, we'll be having uh, Stanley Meredith and Ed Messer who's talking about, <coughs> will robots take our jobs, the socioeconomic impact of intelligent machines? Yes, so I hope to see you there as well. But for this week, we have Matt Graves and Paul Hunter, who are Raven Chronicles writers. And they will be discussing how artists and writers rule the information economy. I will let them introduce themselves. So please give a hand for our speakers today, Matt and Paul. I have a few of magazines. We come out twice a year, literary magazines. You may take one of this, okay? Patrons, revolutions, romantics, and boarding house reach. Pursuing a life in the literary arts. During the last 4,000 years, where art existed at all, for most artists, making a living meant begging from those in power. Historians call it patronage, though most of it went without saying, part of the facts of life absorbed absorbed by osmosis. Some rich person, king or noble, bishop or abbot, cardinal or pope, would be approached by an artist, a painter, sculptor, or poet, and if the rich person liked what they saw, the two might arrive at, at an understanding whereby the artist would be clothed and fed, perhaps uh, given supplies and a stipend along with a series of commissions which were really command performances. He might also sometimes be given a tedious, responsible job as personal secretary or teacher of a rich man's kids in return for his work being sponsored, tacitly approved, owned, and enjoyed by the wealthy man and his family. If the artist remained properly subservient, the arrangement might be lifelong. To some extent, patronage still goes on today, politely bailed through a couple of mechanisms I will come to in a minute. To, today, perhaps, an end point is approaching for the written arts, where nearly everyone is an artist, a poet, though maybe not even a writer. And there is no professional publication, only self-publication. No need of it, really. No shame in its absence or limitation, perhaps because with everyone, an author, and each reading only himself, the real need is to connect with others for the endless jockeying that constitutes a career that seems a lot like waiting in line for your turn at the proverbial 15 minutes of fame. And for all... For that, all you need is a smartphone, tablet, or laptop, and a Wi-Fi hookup. As for friends, well, there's that old saying, misery loves company. Let's face it, the situation for a person craving a career in the literary arts looks pretty bleak. Publishing, as we have known it, isn't just in decline, it's on life support. Never mind serious criticism, reviewing is practically defunct. When even Copper Canyon has to aggressively fundraise to launch a new book by a luminary like W.S. Merwin at the peak of his powers, has to rely on flogged pre-publication sales to close the deal, publishing has become terminally risk-averse. Everything has to be a bestseller. 
And why? Because most of the old publishing houses have been bought by media conglomerates who have no patience with the cash flow problems of the book trade. As a business with benefits lasting years, even centuries, it is hard for book publishing to stand or fall by quarterly balance sheets judged by those, those who possess no love of the word written, sung, spoken, or otherwise. Before we go further, let's introduce the central metaphor of my title, Boarding House Reach. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, poor young working people moving out of their poor parents' homes, getting their first jobs, along with older people who never married, never made enough money to even have a life, might live in what was called a boarding house that offered a bare cell and bed, a meal or two, and a meal or two a day as part of the rent. Often widows or single women with children ran such boarding houses, did the cooking and laundry, and that landlady would sit at the head of the table surrounded by boarders who were paid up and in good standing while the, those poor boarders in arrears might be clustered at the lower end, below the salt, as the medieval, medieval saying went. The landlady would pass out the most desirable food to the paying customers, ladle out the gravy, and then what was left might be passed down the table where what you got depended on your ability to swing a sharp elbow and be quick with your boarding house reach. As one of a family of eight that came from a world of large families, I can tell you that sometimes you might get forked in the back of your hand while reaching for that last potato, or biscuit. What I'm trying to say is that not all the arts are equal in the boarding house of life. The arts that demand and usually garner the lion's share are symphony, opera, theater, film, public sculpture, and architecture. Arts that depend on the cooperation of artists and artisans from many disciplines. Arts, artists of diverse talents straining for a unity of vision. By comparison, the written arts can be done alone, in silence, with just pencil and paper, or these days, pencil and paper, <laughs> or these days with a laptop and printer and Wi-Fi. And it can be done with much less. A famous political prisoner in an Indonesian pr prison in the 80s and 90s for decades denied pencil and paper, would write all over a bar of soap with a burnt match. And every morning he would read that small piece of his novel to six other inmates, then wash his hands and start on the next day's installment. It took years to finish the book, decades, which then existed only in the minds of that small secret cluster and those they told on their afternoon gatherings and the exercise yard. But now having implied that writing is the lowest of the low, perhaps defunct, at best obsolete, I want to cheer you up. Writing is at the heart of many cooperative arts. Opera borrows plots and stories and characters from Don Quixote and Shakespeare and the Norse sagas and theater demands condensed expression and at its best moments, poetry. Film depends more than it might care to admit on novels, short stories, novellas. For most cooperative art forms, writing creates the armature and glue that holds it all together. Which is to say that writers, poets, storytellers of all kinds, if they learn to work with others, can have lucrative careers. Not that the writer is the boss, they're usually not, but that cooperative spirit can carry one a long way. But let's get back to matters of funding and patronage. Most of the poets in the United States live by teaching creative writing in one form or another. I know of only two poets fortunate enough to live by their writing in the last century, Robert Frost, Charles Bukowski. Somewhere in his 50s, Frost reached an agreement with his publisher, Henry Holt, that he would receive a regular advance on royalties from his books, which 
eventually amounted to $1,000 a month, though he still supplemented his income with readings and teaching the occasional seminar. Bukowski's arrangement with Black Sparrow Press was similar, starting at $600 a month, but his arrangement was unique in this respect. His publisher, John Martin, told him that all he wanted him to do was fill a manila envelope with what he wrote each month. Just keep it coming. He didn't have to title the pieces or arrange them in any way. And his publisher then organized and titled his books, treating what he wrote as ore in a gold mine. When he died in 1994, there was no falling off in quality or volume, since there was so much material that hadn't yet seen the light of day. I think 12 or 13 books were published after Bukowski's death. Finally, a dozen years after Bukowski died, John Martin retired and shortly died shortly thereafter, and Bukowski's literary journey came to an end. But let's get back to patronage. It was really killed off by the revolutionary age, that strenuous period of class struggle that started with the American Revolution in the 1770s and carried through the French Revolution of the 1780s and 90s, which resulted in a dictatorship and the Napoleonic Wars that ended with the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Then the nations that finally finished Napoleon of Waterloo agreed to put all the crowned heads back on all the thrones and as they said then, turn back the clock, pretending that the rights of man, liberté, égalité, fraternité, all that had never been. But it wasn't so easy, especially not for the poets who had grown up at that time and tasted the sweetness of new subjects, forms, and voices all their own, not dictated by someone who also commanded that his boots be licked till they shone. So starting with the great romantics, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats, and forerunners like William Blake and John Clare, there arose a new vision of writers in garrets who worked at menial and specifically non-literary tasks, who were free to starve, but who in return might astonish the world. Make no mistake, these were revolutionaries, rarely welcomed into the drawing rooms of wealth and power. A century passed then before the arts in the arts a replacement was found for patronage. So the 19th century was very dark. By the aging robber barons in the early 20th century, some of them, some of whom were persuaded to give large sums of money to them, fund civic enterprises. To give back. Carnegie, Rockefeller, Ford, Fulbright, Guggenheim, Whitney, Mellon, and others at first endowed culture in the form of libraries, museums. But then the government allowed families to create their own tax-free foundations, stipulating that 7% of the assets be spent every year on some worthy social or cultural cause. Why would a family give its money away, you might ask? The answer is because if you have enough, what else is there to buy or build or do with it anyway? Family foundations let those fortunes be kept intact and used to support the causes approved by the family, which is a form of social clout, of power. Early on, most of the boards were family members, though it is serious work giving money away. And these days, the family will select and pay an executive and staff handsomely to conduct the foundation's affairs. During the Great Depression, one further player was created and lives on as a model for state, county, lo local action in the shape of the Arts Commission. As part of the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, Roosevelt included artists, giving them suitable tasks in the case of authors writing state and regional histories, others filming, orchestrating, and giving voice to ambitious projects 
like the Tennessee Valley Authority and control of flooding on the Mississippi and the Dust Bowl and on and on. These arts projects, which included all manner of artists, have carried on in the regular grants offered by arts commissions, paid for by public funding. Now we finally arrive at the imperative. What should I do as a writer in order to have a career and live a sustainable life? First, I would suggest that you find a craft, a paying gig, and make it something that will, that will feed you more than just money. Perhaps supply you with a wealth of subjects for your writing, sharpen your powers of observation and reflection, deepen your human connection. Practically any craft will do. Blake scratched out a living as a professional engraver. He was considered an artisan, not an artist, though he used that skill to engrave and illustrate his own poems at a very high level. John Keats was studying to be a doctor had he lived. Teaching creative writing is tough on those who choose its path because the teaching can turn you inward, and when it doesn't lead you to imitate your own students, can too often make your writing self-reflexive and didactic. What do I mean? Here's a tip-off. When a poet at a reading uses a phrase like, as I always like to tell my students, <laughs> the game is practically over when you start quoting and congratulating yourself. <laughs> I know three fine poets who are pediatricians, two of them in the Seattle community, following in the steps, footsteps of William Carlos Williams. And though I don't know how they manage it, I can hear their daily practice singing through their work. I know a few fine poets who are farmers, as is Wendell Berry, and I have a better guess about their sources of quiet contemplation and strength. Ted Kuzer and Wallace Stevens were insurance executives which doesn't seem to have harmed either poet's work or character. Eugene O'Neill was a deckhand on a tramp steamer. Work outside the craft of words will enrich and enliven any writer. And it should be no surprise that there is a secret net network of support for all the arts. One of the best actresses I know for years had a job as a bank teller with an understanding boss who let her take a leave of absence whenever she got a role. I know musicians who work in music stores with that proverbial understanding boss who will let them go on tour, come back to work, and not suffer. Earlier, I painted a dark picture of the future of books and publishing, but I don't really believe it's that bad. In the last year or two, some of publishing has come back from the abyss. And I don't think it will ever go away or be replaced by social media, because for all the connectedness, some facts can't be altered. That we are born and die alone, and yet reach out ceaselessly to connect to, with others who are just as solitary, just as easily misunderstood as we that the calm, quiet voice of the writer in your ear some nights can save your life. So here is what you should do. Read everything you can. Toss out whatever insults your intelligence, whatever feels contrived and false. Why? Because writing is a subset of reading, a completion of the transaction that is the written word, that you should grow to understand and deeply love. Next, write every day, even when you don't feel like it, and do three kinds of work. The first kind is new stuff that breaks the ice of the, of the blank page. While you're at it, don't be in any hurry to decide what it is you've got. It might be a song, or a speech from a character in a play, or a story that is not you. Coax it out. Let it show you what it is. Ignore it if it starts to lecture you or explain itself. Then do some rewrites. 
Work on things that have been sitting in the dark a while, that may be confused and are certainly unfinished. Almost there, but not quite. The third kind of daily work you should do is the work of, fin of finding an audience, which means reading magazines before you send out any work, which means wondering what the editors are up to and seeing where you might fit in, which may mean going to an open mic and listening to people you don't know agonize and struggle just as you have been doing, sometimes getting it wrong, sometimes getting it right. And there is one other kind of work you should do that is especially vital now when the written work is, word is under such duress, and that is laboring in the vineyard for the common cause. Doing something that is not just for you, but for the enterprise you share and hope to benefit from. That might mean volunteering to sell a magazine at a book fair, working behind the scenes to help a reading series or a, or a bookstore carry on, helping collate a newsletter letter, helping with proofreading or stapling or any other of a thousand thankless tasks. When you join a worthy enterprise, you might gain the most from it, feeling joined yourself and not alone. After we finish, we'll talk about okay. yeah. <laughs> many things to respond to. <laughs> so I am, uh, I am confused and unfinished <laughs> as a condition. Uh, my name is Matt Briggs. I'm a, a, a prose writer, and I grew up in Palmy. And, um, and when I was 17 years old, I decided not to be an engineer because I went to a high school that was full of aeronautical engineers, and they were all prosperous, and I decided I would be a writer instead, because I was young and foolish. <laughs> and um, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote uh, a number of books. And my first book I started, that, that actually was published, I started writing in 1989. And it was published in 1998. So it uh, took nine years to get published. It was published by, through a grant and published through a small press called Black Parent Press, through a, a prize that it won. And for that book that took me nine years to publish, I was paid a little, I, was, I won a grant for $1,500 and I got a, 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 a check from the publisher in royalties for $700. And that book, um, so I made about $2,100 on that book uh, for nine years of labor. The book was reviewed in the New York Times Book Review, it was reviewed in CNN, um, it was re had good reviews in Publishers Weekly. I was contacted by agents and had another book already written and I was ready to, to make my living as a writer. My next book was accepted for publication in 2000. It wasn't published until 2005. It sold out within six months. I won the American Book Award for that book called Shoot the Buffalo. And um, I was paid uh, a little over $2,000 in royalties for that book. And that book took me, I started writing that book in 1992. So to put that in perspective, in 1992, the largest band in the world was Nirvana. In 2005, Nirvana was a classic rock band. <laughs> And my book came out. <laughs> I made two, about two thousand dollars again for uh, about ten years of labor, and uh, and the book went out of print. And that has been the story of all the books that I've published since then. I thought when I went to graduate school and got a degree as a as a writer that I would be able to uh, fall back on teaching creative writing. That's what all my creative writing teachers told me. You do. And um, when I came back to Seattle. I got a job adjuncting, as a, which is kind of the route you take, for a college in Everett, Washington, called Henry Cogswell College, which was a vocational school, which is now closed, for um, Boeing, had a lot of Boeing engineers there, so I taught composition classes. I was paid $300 a month to teach at, and uh, the rent at that time in Seattle, I was able to find a one-bedroom apartment for $1,200 with my family. So my option was to actually get a real job. <laughs> so I started working, uh, at, that, at that time, Microsoft had a massive fight with its contractors. So there were a lot of contracting jobs at Microsoft, which is how I got my first kind of job in the tech industry uh, as a desktop publisher doing flight, uh, what's called pre-flight analysis on all of the, the boxes that they printed. So I did, checked all the boxes, made sure that the files would print, 
and send them off. So it's a job where I had a queue, and I just went through them and checked them all day long, and I got paid a lot more than $300 a month to do that. And since then, I have found that working in the tech industry has been a very welcome kind of uh, way of earning a living. Um, I work with a lot of people who have a humanities background, and, uh, and I earn a lot more than anybody that I know that has gone through the full adjuncting route. Um, and unfortunately, that, that, that's kind of a tragedy, what's happened with adjuncts in, in, in teaching uh, in college. Many of those people did, a few of those people have actually managed to get tenure track jobs, but many of those people haven't as well. And so you're looking at uh, people who work 10, 15 years, um, collect food stamps, and are working for large institutions that charge tens of thousands of dollars for tuition. So the concept uh, as a person in the humanities that you have teaching to fall back on, teaching I think is wonderful. I've learned a lot from teaching as a part-time thing, just like I've learned a lot from writing novels as a part-time thing as well. And I found that working in the tech industry has been really actually pretty fantastic in some ways, but there are many sinister aspects of it as well. And I, I was wondering when I was talking about, when I was looking at this, this talk and thinking about what I would talk about, why people in the humanities actually thrive in an industry that is sort of associated with the, the, the geek, the sort of math nerd. And, and it has occurred to me that the, the main reason is that people who have, if I had gone and gotten an engineering degree, I would have been focusing on well, hard math, applied math, where I would have been learning about um, finding the right answer, uh, essentially as quickly as possible, uh, thinking in a very procedural way to generate the right answer. And I would have been involved in learning a lot of very technical <coughs> subjects. It would have taken me maybe 10 years to become a decent computer programmer, and I would have invested a lot of time in becoming skilled at this, this task. And in the humanities, that wasn't the case. I ended up always not knowing what it was I was looking at and became, I think, comfortable in my abject ignorance and that has been uh, a benefit. Um, was thinking about, I had taken a class at the University of Washington in literary studies and then learned about feminist uh, critiques, Marxist critiques, deconstruction, uh, historical analysis, and I had all of these tools that I had learned in this class, and then I took a class in Milton, and I was really excited to be able to start applying some of these different critical methodologies to Milton. And the very first day, the instructor came in and, and started talking to us about this poet, John Milton, who uh, was a, um, an English poet who wrote Paradise Lost. And um, he told us that Milton was a prophet of God. <laughs> Tenure track teacher. And his word that Milton was a prophet of God completely made all of the literary analysis that I had learned completely irrelevant because you can't really do feminist, feminist critique of God <laughs> and get a passing grade <laughs> or deconstruction or historical analysis. It's really a situation where I didn't have any theological training. I had no way of actually knowing or understanding how you interpret a prophet's words through poetry. <laughs> what does that even look like? Um, and instead of dropping the class, I proceeded through the class using the skills that I had learned in the humanities to completely shift my paradigm and learn how to write and think about uh, if, you, I'm also an atheist, so that was a bit of a problem, but if, <laughs> if, you, if you were to take this, this idea that Milton is a prophet of God, literally, how do you write something sensible about Paradise Lost? Wow. And it, it ends up being an interesting exercise and something I think people in the humanities are capable of doing. If you are a math-focused person and you were to counter such a contradiction, your typical response, I think, would be geek rage. You would be completely like, this does not compute. <laughs> These things don't belong together. And you would literally have to either shift your paradigm rapidly, which would be a skill you hadn't learned, or, or you would you would you would just have to drop out of the class or no, do something to add to the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in the in the humanities, you have you have this ability to adjust rapidly to paradigm shifts. And what's happened in the tech industry is that we are, well, there's we are at a point where change is actually just inherently there. Everything that you're learning right this minute has already been replaced. 
Like right now, we're in the, the, the very end of this thing called the, the mobile revolution, which happened with the release of the iPhone in 2007, and it's completely altered the tech industry. Uh, before 2007, Microsoft was really the dominant player in the tech industry. Uh, they they botched their mobile operating system and have missed they missed the the, the, the paradigm shift and they're still a very important company, but they missed it. And other companies have come to the foreground because, such as Apple, because they were able to anticipate what was happening in the industry. And we're now we're in the middle of a major paradigm shift that we're not even quite sure what it is. Is it going to be cloud computing? Is cloud computing going to completely alter our paradigm? Maybe it already has, and we're not yet sure about that. There's also a thing called the Internet of Things, which is maybe a phrase you've heard about, which is all of the objects in your house will be able to talk to each other and you basically will enter into a kind of amorphous environment of data and interaction. We don't know yet what that's going to be like. And as somebody who it takes 10 years to learn how to become a great coder, for instance, you're suddenly looking at everything you know might be completely altered tomorrow and you don't know. In the humanities, I, for, for the humanities background, I accept my ignorance. I accept I don't know what that's going to look like, and I'm kind of eager to find out what that might be like. The, 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 the super geek, if they're locked into that paradigm of right and wrong answer, it's got to be horrified. And there's kind of, in the tech industry, there's always this sort of sense that you are betting your future on a certain technology. So you're going to learn to program uh, C sharp, uh, a particular kind of programming language that uses object orientation. You're going to become very, very skilled at C sharp, uh, which Microsoft rolled out really in 2000 and is now already beginning to show its age. It's a very robust, powerful technology, but a technology that was kind of trivial at the same time called JavaScript has become now the big, powerful language that everybody wants to use. But in the context of C sharp, it's a toy language. So you're always constantly betting on these different paradigms, not knowing exactly what's going to happen. So that's my, my point of view with how writers will get information from you. But having a grounding in the humanities, you're constantly confronted with these paradigm shifts. You're, when you take a class, certainly you're learning art history, you're learning the sequence of when things are happening, but you're also learning that there are ways of looking at the world that are completely outside of your own perspective, and you need to be open to that. I was just going to say, um, maybe not everybody here knows what a humanities, oh. what the humanities are. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was thinking about that, because you, you had mentioned Copper Canyon, too. Do you guys know Copper Canyon Press? Yeah, OK. So Copper Canyon Press is one of the largest, most prestigious poetry presses in, 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 in the United States. Yeah. And it was founded in, in, in Washington State, in uh, Port Townsend, by Sam Hamill and Tree Swenson in the late 60s, early 70s. I don't know exactly the right days. Yeah. And so it, it, it was a grassroots, it was kind of DIY endeavor. And they grew it up into a very <coughs> very powerful, wonderful poetry house. And it's now kind of dealing with a lot of the changes in technology. In terms of humanities, um, humanities is really the, the kind of the opposite, I think, of, of a STEM education. So humanities would be, um, uh, critical thinking would be a big part of what humanities education is. So that is where you make a proposition and you make kind of an argument around that that supports it. I remember. I had a debate class in, in the late 80s, and the subject was the legalization of drugs. And I took up the, the argument, drugs should be legalized, thinking, well, it's obvious they should be. And then my opponents took up, drugs shouldn't be legalized, and they didn't care whether they were right or wrong, they just had the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the humanities, you, you, you ha have the skill of sort of thinking about it critically, and trying to come up with an argument and evidence around what that is. Now, one of the downsides to, to that process is that you can find evidence anecdotally, and it makes a strong argument. But again, even that, you can just be critical, self-critical about that because of your humanities background. Humanities are, uh, uh, focuses on kind of the history of ideas and concepts, and, uh, and essentially different paradigms and the sort of flow of history from our beginnings to, to our our current state, which I, I actually think is a very, I think in Seattle, right now, 
Um, we are, we have a view, a, a sort of a historical view that is unique and, and helpful because we're so close to the center of change in, in, in Silicon Valley that, um, that we're able to make some kind of broader observations around what's happening, really historically. Um, to, to take a, a thousand foot view, I was looking at a book called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler, which is a very old book. But he, he divides history into three, two, three segments, which is uh, Neolithic, and then essentially the Middle Ages, and then the Industrial Revolution. And uh, Paul was talking essentially about the Industrial Revolution to, to now. And then, um, and then there's post-World War II. Um, and the difference between the Industrial Revolution and the Middle Ages is the advent of uh, machines and nations, so countries. And the countries correspondingly come with people who say, we have rights, you should respect our rights, even though you're a larger entity, and no longer will kings tell us what to do because they own us, we own ourselves, and we have rights in relation to this, this state. What happened after World War II, these machines began, became more and more automated, and so automated processes that might be found in something like a corporation began to assume their own autonomy, um, we have the technology, the, the pace of technology picked up because of the spreading of, of it throughout the world. And so you have then nation states themselves no longer become the, the locus of power, but, but large corporations that are global in nature. And it, that has reconfigured really the relationship of our, us as citizens and people in relation to, to what? To our, our, our country or to these corporations. What are we in relation to these corporations? Corporations have been very quick to claim their, their rights and benefits. And, Unfortunately, citizens of countries have maintained the sort of fiction of our belonging to a nation and not to being citizens of, of a globe, and that we all are connected and both have our own rights that are inalienable whether or not we're a citizen of a different country. And so we, there's a shift that I would say is essentially putting us into what might be called globalism rather than modernism, which would be the Middle Ages up to World War II. For a while, they called this thing Postmodernism, which was always a really annoying term. <laughs> I don't know if you guys use that term anymore. Um, I think in retrospect, postmodernism is kind of the fuzzy looking into the future, going, what if things have changed, we don't know what they are. And I think now we're finally getting a kind of definition around that. And as writers, I think writers are able to navigate that kind of change. People with a, a, a grounding in the history of ideas and critical thinking, uh, and, and, and I would hope kind of an understanding of what it means to be a person in relation to these ideas, um, I think are equipped to handle those kinds of changes. If you are just executing right and wrong answers, um, you're going to find yourself, I think, in a, a lost position. So, thanks. individual, every letter was a little piece of lead type. And you locked it into a, you locked it into a, a, a chase, and everything's backwards. Everything, every letter is backwards. You locked it into a chase, you ran rollers with ink on them over the surface of the type or the image, and you kissed it to a piece of paper. And the way you can tell if it's letterpress is the paper dented. So you got Paul, Paul the letter dented. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I have I have a little shop full of old, old tools. It'll never wear out. So, so if you find a book in the library here that's probably printed before, oh I would say the thirties, it would either be letterpressed or it would use something called hot type, which essentially takes lead and pours out a whole entire line at the same time that has been composed on a different machine and then it's printed in essentially the same way. And so you get that impact on the page. You turn it in the light, you can see the actual impression. But that's another aspect of, the, of the, all of this change that I find 
fascinating is how, how much the digital has become just a given. Yeah. That that material, the material reality of a printed page that has been impacted has a tangible, it's just tangible compared to uh, an LCD screen, for instance. Right. We, yeah. We're used to, we're used to um, being able to play with the size, <coughs> the scale of whatever we want. We can take a little one and blow it up and take a big one and squeeze it down and we want it to look sharp. Um, whereas if you look at letterpress, everything is seen in exactly the scale that it was created. I carved these wooden blocks for the images in the books that I do. And the wooden blocks are, you know, they're, if I want a small one, I have to carve a small one. I have to be able to see a small one. I have to use a magnifying glass. You can't pinch it. That's <laughs> no. it. And, and, and the, the oddness of this is that, well, once you get it all, the, the press all set up and ready to run, it's all, all the effort is, is in the front end. All the effort of setting the type and laying it out and all that, and playing around with it until you get it just right. The press can print things as fast as, you know, you're, you're almost as fast as your, as your Copy. computer printer. But anyway, I mean, I have questions for you guys. How many of you are artists or think of yourself as doing some arts? Yes, yes. So you, um, some of you are hot, hiding, holding back, but you're, you actually are, but you're not, not ready to cop to it yet. Um, and the thing was, the thing was, the whole point of my enormous sweeping ramble was that, it, that we have different expectations about finding and connecting with an audience than we ever used to. If you, if you only had to please one rich person, you know, hey, I'm the queen's guy. The queen likes what I do. I don't have to have anybody else like what I do. Well, it was rare. It was rare for a career like Shakespeare's to come along. Shakespeare was not a rich guy, and he, he made a, a fortune by being a shareholder in a in a, a very unusual company of actors. He made his money from the writing only because he was an actor and only because he's part of these 12 shareholders. He got paid, the normal uh, playwright got paid two or three pounds, four pounds, for, for a play that would be printed and the, and the printer would then own the copyright. This went on for, the, the printer owned the copyright for Milton. Yeah, so I guess the, 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 word, the, word, the word career yeah. and, and, and writer, to me, at this, at this stage of, of my concept, are, are almost separate. There's a vocation or something you're drawn to do. Whether or not you're paid to do that is, right. is, is separate. Uh, and, and we, I think that Culturally, we still buy into this idea that people who make, first of all, I, I don't want to get into whether or not people deserve to get paid. They, everybody, I think, deserves a living, regardless of what they do, from my perspective. But, um, but the, idea, the idea that, that, that somehow. He's a communist. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but, pr but pretty much, pretty much. Um, but the idea, the idea that you, you produce art, therefore you should be paid, I, I see that as a, a separate question. Than, than actually the, the, having the time and the space and the permission from yourself to actually produce produce art that you're, you're serious about, you're investing your sense of identity in. But don't you think the government should pay artists? No, I think the government should pay everybody. I don't but think artists, <laughs> I actually don't believe artists have a special status. There, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I don't agree with that. Yeah, I know. Well, I, 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 well, I don't think a special status, but I do think that the, the country, the, well, in France and, uh, have you ever heard of in the United States where everybody in the whole fucking country comes out for you know for a poet like they do in France or something? They don't do that here. No, no. But why should they? I mean, it, it's. Well, oh, but yeah. in 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 the the dying days of the of the USSR, 
uh, poets poets would get twenty to forty thousand people. Oh, yeah. Right. You know, mean. filling right. soccer stadiums right. for a poetry reading. But that's because they were hungry for something that they weren't getting anywhere else. Oh, yeah. You know, we have to sort some motivations out here. One of them is I would do what I do as a writer no matter what. I have been more successful quitting drinking than I have been quitting writing. <laughs> and that, and I'm, te I'm telling you the truth, that I've tried to not write. I tried not writing a couple of times for up to a year. And then just because I'm not making a dime at it, it's taken many years to get something that I think is really good and it's speaking to this moment in time. And, and you know, there's this sadness and bitterness in, in the taste of your mouth and when a, a book that you put everything into takes six or eight or ten or a dozen years to see the light of day. I, I, I'm finishing a manuscript that I started in uh, 2006. A year before the iPhone came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called Monsters of the Air. But um, yeah. well, Matt has won a genius award from a stranger, so it's kind of sad that he can't make a living as a writer. Well, no, but that's that's just a little bit. Oh. <laughs> that's just, yeah, but but it, but it maybe, writing, so that was maybe writing. just yeah. it's you know that that's see we're down to this this is down where the ducks go barefoot. Yeah, you know that that I think a culture needs its artists. Yeah. It needs. Yeah. It desperately needs its painters and singers and poets and storytellers. It needs every one of them. I mean, and, and I must say that for a for a, a good stretch, I I uh, ran a poetry reading series. I did it for 10 years. And and running an open mic for 10 years. And it was weekly for 10 years. That is to say, and there would be 40, 50, 60 people sometimes for a reading. There and, and some some of them would be people who were regulars and some of them people who had never seen before. They needed that experience because most of us can't get an audience at all. I've been fortunate, but I've also been struggling at time, various times in my life to get, to get to an audience. And I don't mean get to an audience for money's sake because I don't get any money from it anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess part of what my, my argument though too was you're not outside of society in her commerce, I guess, even, if you are an artist. You actually can sell out. <laughs> your skills, your skills actually as a, as a person trained in the humanities or trained as an artist, as a visual artist or as a writer, are actually valuable skills to, to information technology. And there are jobs that, that, that can utilize those skills. Um, I mean, I have a conflict here in that, in that um, I, see, I, see, I see these writing a novel or writing poetry or Painting or making music as something that, that, that should be beyond its value to a company. It, it, it has it a value beyond that and, and outside of that. But at the same time, you do need to, to make rent. You need to pay money right. to, to survive. Right. And how do you do that? WPA, we should have another one. Well, we don't. We, we, we don't. I mean, the, the large the large social. I mean, unless we unless there's a, a miracle next year, the, the large social state is 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 on its way out, particularly for the United States. And so we are stuck with these large corporations who have, who are telling us that we have to return, we have to be, have, make a return on investment. <laughs> They're going to give us a certain amount of money, and we have to make them a certain amount of money in return. And in fact, artists can do that for these companies. Amazon's not going to support artists. But, 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 right. but, but Amazon As does. Artists. Amazon does. I mean, Amazon. As artists. Yeah, Amazon has people that are artists who work there. Oh, yeah. yeah. The issue, the issue with Amazon really is that I believe Amazon's fundamental values as a company are faulty. That it will, it will fail eventually yeah. if it's run the way that it is, yeah. and that there's an opportunity there for somebody who can, can make a company that can actually provide. Again, this is all corporate speak. A kind of value that's going to going to undermine or take away the business that Amazon is is is, is built on. 
that there are there are opportunities there because Amazon's vision is, is faulty. Um, I mean, yeah, I wish we could return to a world in which um, we could say to a state, "Be our patron and pay us money to do our art." But, but what, what is Amazon's vision? Amazon's vision, I believe Amazon's vision is, is to be a, a mechanism between you and your desire. Everything. That you, you want something and it is there for you to take. And you will not be aware of, of that transaction even taking place. It will just come out of your bank account and you will have whatever you desire. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will be as minimal, tra minimal resistance to that satisfaction as possible. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, <laughs> though, you won't get... You won't get a sort of the a sort of expertise in each of the many many different kinds of things of your that you might desire. Am I getting? Uh, you can buy a guitar from Amazon, and as a person who made guitars for a long time, I'm still tinker with them. Uh, how how can you tell whether the guitars are any good? Well, that you I, bought I, I actually Amazon? I actually think that algorithms in the long run will be far more far more accurate than anything that you could do yourself. And so so it would it would it would ostensibly then calibrate itself to know let's say it worked ideally. It would it would be like, oh, this is an artisanal guitar designed by the best guitarist ever. You've paid the money that would get you that, but Amazon has provided that to you. And there is no other transaction. You're like, I cannot believe this is the guitar of my dreams because I wanted this and here it is. <laughs> if that's their dream well, the thing is that we have, that we have, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, feedback. Yes. We have these feedback loops and we we'll give them, you know, one to five stars yes. based on promptness of delivery and how good the goods were. Yes. And all like that. So yeah. what kind of vision should they have? Um, that, that cuts out all of the context of, of where a good com good goods come from, for instance. The, the product that you've just received is provided to you at lowest cost. Well, that lowest cost varies all kinds of costs, the, the manufacturing conditions, who made that, where they came from, what the, what the, where the country was, or, or so working conditions, right. working so conditions the, are, the laborers. The laborers are actually the, the, the social fabric in which normal, your normal goods and services are provided to you. Those are all cut out of the picture, so you're just receiving something at the lowest cost, the highest quality at the lowest, like, at the lowest cost. But the so, high quality, but, yeah. you know, but what happens? And so, and so what you get eventually is not what you get is basically you're attached to Amazon like it's a symbiotic structure. <laughs> it's like your face is sucked into this. Well, we're, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> we're, we're not there. That, be, that seems that seems to be this is a great movie idea. Well, it's so, already been done. So you know they're making movies now. So you know, and and probably those are not the best movies. Well, movies? No, they, they they do they do good programming. I mean, it's. Uh, um, I mean, I think the the, the, what the transparent is one Emmys that things. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's uh, it's not that. It's to me, to me, the the, the the sort of the tell are things like their button that they want to put onto your onto your onto your uh, washing machine where you can just get mm -hmm. new. Right. So essentially, that button will be embedded into with the Internet of Things. That button gets embedded into the actual washing machine. Your washing machine always has a charge in it because Amazon fulfills it for you. You go. You, you have a smart refrigerator. That refrigerator always has what you want in it, and you can just consume it. And it's being supplied to you by, well, basically by a, a truck would just drive into your neighborhood. Drones would deploy from the truck and deposit them, <laughs> deposit them into a, into a receptacle, and it would go into your refrigerator, and you would never have to do anything except to take out your <coughs> and go to the restroom. So, you know, provided you were making them. I just wanted to, to ask if there are any other questions before we yeah. before we yeah. close from anyone else in our in our audience. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sure. I, I've got a, perhaps a perverse idea about art, and I, I, I can't escape it. Just has me trapped, and that's that we have this um, concept of who are artists, you know, because mm -hmm. there are people I think, as you put out, Paul, who can't not do it and become known because they have that addiction, whatever you want to call it. They can't not do it. Those become the people we recognize as artists. Okay, some of them hide out. You don't know it. A lot of some of them come out. But the truth is that everyone needs expression. They need expression. They don't just want expression. They need expression. So 
If you're going to talk about who are, what is art and who are artists, all of a sudden the boundaries are blown wide open because some guy in his garage that's fixing 427 Hemi's and likes right. to take with engines, right. it's his expression, he loves it. He feels fulfilled doing it. I would think that, that would probably call the guy, that guy or woman an artist. Probably nobody. But if it's fulfilling the need for expression, then he's doing his art. And, and so all of a sudden the boundaries of who are artists and what is art just dissolve. All of a sudden it's a cultural need. And we recognize some people because they get known and they paint or they write or they video the movies. But they're everywhere. Now, and I, I can't quite escape that idea. It's just, I just throw it out. It's, you know, I love the idea that the boundaries are just gone. Sure. 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 When I said, I, and I was hoping everybody would say they were an artist. <laughs> Everybody would say, I need to be doing that. I do something that has that, that, that touches something that deep in me. And building a Hemi, it, or, or, I mean, I have a friend who's, who blueprinted engines for race, race cars. And, and he had that compassion, that, that energy, that deep, that detailed look at things that's like anybody who's a writer who's trying to get this one phrase to just fall in place and make it all sing. Mm -hmm. I think passion precedes the fulfillment of expression. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing that captures you and keeps you tied and addicted or whatever you want to call it. You know, it keeps you tied to it for all your life. And that's the passion for it. I guess for me, I didn't understand what you meant by artist at first. Because um, I do write poetry and mm -hmm. I write the short stories. But they're so personal that I don't really consider it like, you know, being an artist. I just kind of write them for myself. Have you, have you felt uh, an audience yet? Um, do you, do, who do you write these for? Um, I share them with like my family and friends when I'm confident enough to do it. But a lot of the times it's just me just kind of expressing myself in um, writing. I used to write poetry. Um, been some years since 2007 I graduated from high school so I used to write poetry all the time when I was in high school and do like spoken word pieces for the schools and stuff like that but I haven't in like the last probably eight or nine years so I just kind of keep it to myself so I didn't, I didn't really consider myself an artist I guess but you may be bit you may have the bug yeah. <laughs> sounds like you do have the bug yeah it's it's that, that phrase, I think, is used to silence people a lot, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the term artist. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously, we're all, we've encountered people who, I'm an artist, and you're like, hush, yeah. <laughs> you know, please stop giving me that, that work I don't want. So you're afraid, and you use a term like that, that you are, you are impinging on other people somehow. Yeah. And, and, and conversely, it feels almost, um, I don't know, like you are bigger than your britches by, by, mm -hmm. by, by sharing your work with other people. <laughs> but you know, I, I think that that's that's part of it. Is that if you have to, if you if you, if you feel compelled to do that, then, then you are. And that's what you want. So there's no there's no problem. Yeah. What makes you like writing? Because I I have a writing class, but I don't like writing a lot. So what makes you like writing? I, I, no, I hold, I hold out hope. See, for every for every poem or story that that I write, I mean, I, they're probably, probably one in a hundred. One in a hundred of the things that I work on see the light of the, see the light of day, or it, are published in a magazine or as a book. And, and, you know, it, I, I started this at, at about the age of 15. I suddenly realized reading that I wanted I wanted that. Yeah. I wanted to be like those people. I wanted to be like her and him, uh, that they could somehow sing like that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to do that. And at the same time, at 15, I knew how bad everything I did was. And it took another dozen years of consciously being bad, but trying this hard thing to finally start to get a little success. To, to have a whole poem that hung together and sang. 
Yeah. Yeah. Almost that opposite right. feeling with it. Um, writing for me is a way of, of, of keeping company with myself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, oh, and so, um, and so I, 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 you know, I you can meet other people, but it's very difficult to meet yourself. And so, <laughs> right to peel um, all that and everything so, away. So to write something down and come back to it later, you, you encounter it as a piece of language that's coming from somewhere else, which is actually, me. and so I can see myself in, in a way that's clearer. Than mm -hmm. And so it is narcissistic, I suppose, but um, you know I, that's the only way that I can I can talk to myself. In a way that but the, the I don't think it's narcissistic usually. I mean. Uh, all those people and all those open mics, and there are a few people who just are so full of themselves that none, they don't see the world. But if I can, I see someone and I can see the world through her eyes or his eyes. I can see what their experience is like. You know, we try so hard with the, with the, the media to not be alone. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, Leonardo da Vinci said, when I am in company, I feel I am only half myself. And that's me. <laughs> that's me too. Because if I can't get things quiet enough, I can't get to know myself. Yeah. Or this good man. <laughs> I think for me, um, I developed the work for writing because when I was in elementary school, I had a learning disability. And um, mm -hmm. I couldn't really, I could read, but it was like small things. Like I could see certain things and I could memorize certain words. Um, when I got to be maybe like third or fourth grade, um, I was behind in reading and writing. So I, um, my parents had got me somebody to like help me. and. Um, I think what made me become a writer was because I couldn't spell at first. And then um, learning how the certain sounds and certain letters make certain words, say certain words, you know. Um, I think it got to a point where I started loving words. Like, I love new words, I love big words. So I started doing like dictionary.com, getting like stuff emailed to me all the time and stuff like that. And to practice writing, I would like purposely try to use those words that I learned today, or just like even talking to, listening to you guys today, I've jotted down some words, like that'll help me kind of, that helps my writing because new words, of course, create new pieces. And um, that's really why I started writing. And that's kind of like an outlet for me when I'm upset, happy, or anything like that, I just write. And a lot of the times it's because I learned a new word. like. Okay, that's a cool word. I'm gonna figure out how to use this into a poem, a short story, or anything like that. So that's kind of how I developed writing, really. Throughout <laughs> time for me to officially close, I invite you to continue to stay and continue the conversation if you have time. I also recognize that uh, we are a little bit over, so if you need to leave, I thank you so much for being here, and let's thank our facilitators today. Thank you.